rock on. Well, <clears throat> it's good to have you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is Tuesday, which means it is time for a new episode of Weekly Whiskey. We've got some really fun stuff here tonight. That was probably, I have to say, that was probably the most intense intro we've ever had. So thank you, John, for Just that one. Just trying to keep it hype for you. That's all. I am. My blood pressure went up like 30 points and in the good way. Like, you okay, know, that's, I was, I was aiming for about a 30 point. I'm like, I'm like, good. Ooh, Ooh, I'm going, Oh boy. So oh, yeah, killing it. I love it. Well, it is great to have you guys with us. If you're drinking something awesome, if you're drinking something terrible, let us know in the chat before we get wheeling and dealing tonight, we've got some cool stuff ahead, but I think we should, uh, drop into a little single barrel news right now. Our phantom bird, the wild Turkey, Kentucky spirit, Tyrone, a sorry, allegedly Tyrone, you know, it's hard to tell with these things, is now on sale. It's going through waves one, two, and three, as is our Jack Daniels single barrel. I think in uh, on Thursday, our 420, God, why do we have to pick a 420 barrel? Um, mm-hmm. The 420 2017 Wilderness Trail Rye will drop as well. So three different barrels, three different markets, going to be a good time. Next week is going to be popping. We have our uh, Old Elk cereal series, so old kind of throwback cereal labels from the 90s. Coming out, those are two weeded bourbons and a straight bourbon with a weeded whiskey on the way. Um, those are coming next, and then we'll uh, we'll keep you in suspense for the rest. But lots of cool stuff. Been getting lots of emails, and I think that uh, let's wrap this one up quick so we can get to our uh, our prime guest. But how you doing, my friend? Absolutely outstanding. We've got uh, a curious flight of things to go through tonight. A lot to talk about. We've got our good buddy Will Schreg is from Barrelcraft Spirits coming on here in just a moment, and it would be unlike Will to show up here and not talk about all sorts of crazy shit that we are not even prepared for. <laughs> so I'm really excited to see what he's got for us tonight. Fantastic. Well, before we bring Will on, uh, we have an exciting development here on Weekly Whiskey. Uh, we are brought to you by Mackey. So if you're interested in the audio gear that we have bringing you sweet sounds and John's luscious voice, uh, Weekly Whiskey is made on Mackey. Super pumped about that. We're rocking some new hardware. We've been plugging in wires, cutting holes in walls. Uh, go ahead and check them on out. We'll have some more information in future shows as well as some other big announcements we have. But uh, new gear is humming along nicely. We've worked it on through. And I think, uh, what do you say? Should we get to uh, drinking some whiskey? Yeah, let's move right on to whiskey. Will, how are you, sir? Hey, thanks for having me back. Yeah, good to see you, Will. It's really great to be here. Happy uh, this holiday is is the, the Jewish Yom Kippur. It's um, my people's holiday. So the tr- tradition continues, holiday guest, right? Yes, yes. Our, our right. holiday correspondent here holiday on Liquid Whiskey. Correspondent. Uh, it used to be, we, we go through the major holidays and the obscure holidays. Now we've got a nice Jewish holiday. That's fun. Mm-hmm. We are covering all of our bases, but yeah, it's, it's good. Wherever there is a holiday, there is probably Will Schrag. It's not far behind and a box of 50 million samples. I, yeah. I really thought you tried to kill us with this one, but then we realized <laughs> there were duplicates, which was a relief because John and I were like, uh, there's 12 samples in this box. Like this can't be, this, this isn't going to be like a, like a Tony Robbins infomercial length stream. I don't know how we'll survive otherwise, but we have six great things to drink. Uh, one of them seagrass we talk about at length, but lots of other fun stuff. So thanks for joining us tonight. Of course. I'm really happy to be here and I, I'm really happy to talk about some of these because as you guys know, I've had to keep a lid on at least one of them, but kind of three of them. Hey. Uh, We'll take it. And and now I get to take the lid off, which is great. I get to break all the rules. Cool. Well, we will uh, we'll designate you the breaker of the seal. What should we uh, what should we start with tonight, Will? So I actually think we should jump right in. I think we've talked about this before, but I really everything we do is cask strength. So unless there's something peated or something excessively sweet, uh, I like to drink comparatively. And we have two bourbons that we're trying. So uh, we have the 2021 release of the Gray Label 15 year old bourbon which is just hitting markets like pretty much this week. It's, uh, it's, it's released. It's just pretty new. Um, okay. okay. And it's an, it, it's an interesting, it's the fourth iteration of it. Uh, and it's still a, a somewhat similar form, similar, similar formula. It's a 15 to 17 year old Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana blend. Uh, we still do the same sort of like blend and let sit and polish for about six months technique on it. Okay. Uh, which historically that has, brought it to a lower proof than some of our other batches because we let it sit with air above it. And so it blows off some ethanol. Sure. Uh, a lot of the barrels we used this year were, were, were low proof. So this is cask strength, but it's only a hundred point four proof. Oh, okay. Is this um, the lowest proof the gray label 15 has been? Yes. No, um, it's about two percentage points lower than it's ever been before. Oh, okay. So that's, I mean, significant, but not, but is, um, I, I've always meant to ask this, and it's always eluded me because we we get kind of deep sometimes. The uh, 
where you guys are storing your barrels is that climate controlled or is it, is it more or less kind of open i know it's not open air but are you guys actively heating cooling or just kind of keeping it human livable so in our facility which is just a processing facility it's not a rick house uh the one that we like control completely uh there's one portion of it that's completely ambient temperature with the uh caveat of when we need to work in there we are able to heat it a little bit if okay. it's really cold um but we don't do that unless it's a like personnel issue it's not we're, we're not into artificial manipulation of aging okay it's a, it, not that i don't think that that's a cool thing to play with for other companies it's just not a thing that we're interested in really okay no that's fair uh, the reason i ask is we were actually i was at castle and key i was tapping barrels for something and based on the season they actually tap in a different place of the barrel due to where the mm -hmm. vapors are and, you know, the density and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I, I figure your barrel probably has a pulse on this. So I figured. Yeah. And we've actually warehoused at Castle and Key before, uh, with, along with like 14, 15 other places. And they all have different policies and different ways of doing things. And of course, different temperature, humidity, altitude, yep. swings of temperature and humidity, uh, height of brickhouse, air, air flow, all the things that really affect something over the course of a couple of years. Okay. Um, one thing that uh, doesn't get talked about a lot in the bourbon world, but really the spirits world, is the the temperature and the humidity for the few months before you harvest a barrel is insanely important to the way that it'll taste. Uh, be and because there there's either liquid sitting in the wood or there's liquid pushed back into the barrel. Mm -hmm. And so the same sets of barrels harvest at the end of the summer versus sort of the end of the winter will be drastically different. And it's not because they're six months older. It's because they're either in like a pull situation or a push situation. Uh, and it, it has a lot to do with oak tannin. If the wood that was sitting in the oak gets pushed back in, you wind up with a, a woodier, but also slightly more bitter bourbon and marginally higher yield. It, it's, um, uh, it's funny you mentioned that. We actually, we have uh, 11 different casks all hanging out at starlight and based on that's a distillery in indiana and based yep. on what kind of cask it is we're pulling summer or winter to you know to kind of manipulate that tannin influence so yeah that's um, pretty cool yeah it's cool and it's just one of the things that isn't in the branding of any company really but it is essentially impossible to make a consistent product if you're not harvesting and batting to create ingredients for yourself I, I wonder, and I, I won't pull us too far off in the weeds here, but, you know, obviously when we talk about like late harvest Riesling or, you know, some of those, those are talking about the state of the grape when they're pulled from the vine, clearly. But mm -hmm. I wonder if we'll ever see a, a late harvest, you know, or like a early winter, late fall, if we start to see like seasonal branded releases from some producers to try and highlight that difference. I think we might, but I think that if anyone was really going to put their weight behind that, it was it's going to end up being a bunch of BS anyway. Oh, okay. Um, well. that, that would be my guess that it would be too hard to really differentiate it sure. unless it was like an experimental series, like the Buffalo trace wood experiments they did a long time ago, where there's just like minute differences across a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, but I guess it's really fun to talk to you guys about this. Cause I, it's been what year and a half or so since I was on the first time. I think um, yeah. it's been at right? least, yeah, it's been a while, man. Over a year and, ago. uh, Barrel and now Stellum has gotten so much bigger that there's parts of managing distribution nationally that are lessons that I've had to really learn in the past year or two. And not being too ambitious with projects that you don't know how to communicate across a bunch of different telephones is a, <laughs> is a lesson that I, like, I had to learn and, and our company had to learn. And we've had some things that were hits and some things that were less hits because of the, it's not the inability of us talking about it. It's can we talk to someone who talks to someone who talks to someone who text messages someone and, uh, and so we haven't really toned down how nerdy we're being, but we do think about what is the story of this that that can reach further than we can with one touch because we're a ten person sales team, sure, um, and you know a thirty six person company and we're now in a bunch of countries and almost every state. Wow, thirty-six countries. I did. I did. So thirty-six realize... people. Sorry. Oh, okay. I was no, like, we're, oh, in, uh, we're in like four or five countries, but it looks like we're going to be in Canada in like the next couple of weeks, which is really exciting for me. Oh, okay. Uh, the uh, Great White North. All right. Yeah. Cool. Oh man. Okay. So yeah, I mean, 
I, I couldn't be happier. You're finally here in Wisconsin. I've been buying seagrass like it's going out of style locally. <laughs> locally, I, yeah. you know, I've been able to fly this stuff in for years. But um, support your local retailers. I mean, Woodman's man, Woodman's is taking my money at an alarming pace, and it's all seagrass. So yeah. I'm sure they're not too too upset before by we, it. Uh, before we dive all the way into the whiskey here, we had a comment come through the chat. Jason said that he's never actually pulled the trigger on try, trigger and tried a barrel product. What's a good one to start out with? Um, Will, you want to serve that one? I can, you? but I think you're going to give the same answer I'm going to give. So if you want to go for it, you can. I'm going to say start with the finished stuff and just see what these guys do best. Uh, for me, they have this trio of wild things, Armida, Dovetail, and Seagrass. I would go Seagrass personally oh. because I think it just brings so many things to the, the front of the palate that you aren't expecting and I think it really showcases what these guys can do with the ingredients that they set aside for themselves. Cool. I, uh, Interesting. I think seagrass is the whiskey that people are most excited about from us right now. Uh, but I think Dovetail is the best example of what we do as a company, unless you are a bourbon person. And then there's a couple of batches that I would say are the best examples of what we do. But in general, it's like whichever one is available at the, at the time. Yeah. 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 Um, I think 28 was a really good example of that. I thought 28 was a super well balanced uh, bourbon profile i like that a lot but man getting uh like for me dovetail is like christmas whiskey too there's so many layers on that that's <laughs> really fun i like that one quite a bit and seagrass i mean there's a little bit uh a little bit it's not like shop around the edge it's just you got to be in that mood for it it's and more it's, divisive for sure oh yeah totally and it's just like it's a very unique product too there's nothing like it oh shit there's nothing like seagrass either i guess i don't know <laughs> All their I love that really we're, we're sitting here tasting a $250 bottle of whiskey and we're talking about <laughs> talking our core line. It's great. I, like, that's music to my ears. Uh, no, I mean, I was going to say Dovetail. I think Dovetail is like the quintessential barrel. Seagrass is what happens when you tell the barrel staff to like take a holiday and let loose. And like <laughs> our media is like what happens when you let someone say what if and you just like fucking roll with it, you know. True. But I think Dovetail's, I mean, Dovetail was was late for me in my journey with barrel but immediately became a favorite and in fact when Sealbox released their their library and they had like the first mm -hmm. eight batches of dovetail i went i like bought them all i was like i gotta try every single one of these you know yeah i got like ah oh, geez bottle like 26 of the second batch of dovetail and i'm like i, I like almost don't dare open it i think I yours was lower it. you were in the teens man because we talked right, about well this. i also got i think bottle 11 or 17 of either batch one or three Oh, yes. Okay, okay. So a secret, if you guys, since this is the crowd for it, when we do library releases through Sealbacks, which we do from time to time, it is usually samples that we thought we would need more than we actually did of old releases. And so the bottle numbers are very low because they're not coming out of distribution. They're coming out of like mm -hmm. a storage unit in Kentucky. That's awesome. Um, I think it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, you get the, the ultra nerdy releases where you're like, oh, holy shit, I can't open this. This is like, for no real reason, I feel like <laughs> I should be collecting this and not drinking. Well, it's funny because so our boxes landed at a similar time and he's like, hey, man, um, which which bottle number? And I won't go too far here. But um, and I was like, I don't know, like and I had it in my hands. I was in the middle of opening it and I was like reading his text over my shoulder and. And he was like, oh, you should pay attention because I got like one of the like first teen bottles and like right yeah. as I popped the cork out. And I was like, oh, OK. Cool. And I looked, I've got like 11 and 15 and like nine on the, the three, like the earliest ones I have. And I was like, oh, I, I don't know if they're worth anything, but, mm -hmm. you know, they're open now. But yeah. they're worth something, something to you. Mind, yeah. yeah. I love having it. I have a whole shelf over in the basement bunker that's just barrel because it keeps just accumulating. And it's mostly seagrass at this point, but. There's mm -hmm. so much dovetail and other fun stuff. But anyways, seagrass tangent aside. <laughs> um, Let's taste some of this 15-year. Yeah. Yeah, so 15-year gray label. Uh, we launched, this is the, the fourth iteration of it. Um, when we first released this, it was the first time we'd ever gone above that like 99 maybe $109 price point that we do for single barrels. And it's because we had barrels that were there were, we had so few of them and we felt so good about them. And frankly, they were so expensive for us to get that we needed to create a different way to bring them to market. We got a lot of hate on introducing a $250 bottle. And then like three weeks later, Forbes wrote about it as the best whiskey made in America. 
and suddenly all of the hate was like this hate about allocations it like right. flipped and same people are mad but like about a different thing um, <laughs> now they're mad they can't get it uh and so we've made it each year and we don't try to make it exactly the same but we do try to keep it in this like as woody as you can get without being bitter slightly lower proof for us because of the way that we blend it kentucky tennessee indiana marriage and we spend the whole year vatting ingredients for the gray labels okay. uh because we we know that we want to be able to do a polished blend but we it, it's a lot of work and there's the barrels are coming from different places um uh so we got it out a little bit earlier this year which was exciting and for the second year in a row now it to the to the distributor level completely allocated out on everyone's first order so every distributor ordered whatever we would let them and now it's gone um and in some ways we don't like that, but it also has made for like a kind of like, okay, we did it and we get to move on and go about our business a little bit right. and, and then work with it in the market and taste with people. But uh, it's been really interesting in just four years, the difference of trying to convince people that it's worth thinking of as a special whiskey. And now it's kind of on the list of like expected, expensive, exciting seasonal releases in the bourbon world. Um, and I, I'm excited to hear what you guys think. We were a little bit nervous about the proof being lower and people being upset about that. But the feedback we have gotten from the people who I feel like have really serious bourbon palates is very positive on this one, uh, that it there's a nuance to it, maybe because it's a lower proof or maybe because of the blend that uh, it's not it's not quite as punch you in the face and look for the secrets as it was last year. It's a little bit more like this book smells and looks good. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, right off the bat, I like this more than I like last year's. Okay. Uh, I, there's a big bouquet of fruit on this one. I mean, you get that rich oakiness to it. There is some of this, like, toffee praline kind of hiding in the background. And then as I sipped through it, I noticed that there was uh, a good kick more spice. And as I've shared with you more than once, well, I'm not a big fan of the Tennessee distillate. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that can shove it into a direction that I don't really like, especially on the finish. And this one isn't really doing that. So I kind of like, I don't know if it is, like you said, whether it's the proof or if it was just the way that this one married in the vat, but I think this one came out really, really rounded. Yeah, there's this moment sort of at the end of the mid palate. Have I ever talked to you guys about what I call the cadence of a whiskey? Yes. In that like place between when you're drinking it and when you're thinking about the finish. And I feel like you get a ton of the cream that you get on Indiana releases. Yes, I can see and, that. And it doesn't smell like an Indiana bourbon to me, but right at that like mid palate to finish moment, I get a lot of this like vanilla ice cream kind of note. Yeah, um, there's a little bit heavier mouthfeel that comes along with that sometimes too, and I, I totally catch that in there. I really like here. You you said it, and I wish that more people would do it. Where you said we want to make this as oaky as possible without being bitter because that's the moment where John and I go from like friends to frenemies. Um, mm -hmm. cause like he loves oaky, bitter old things. And I'm like, I love Oak, but the moment it gets just the tiniest bit like tannic and bitter, like I'm out, like I'm waving the white flag, like get me out of here, you know? Um, and I think this, this really nails it. Like it, it is oaky. And I, this is oaky, almost like Russell's reserve 13. Um, but it doesn't hit that bitter kind of tannic back of the throat note. And, and the creaminess comes through. Like, I, I really do like this one. And last year's was definitely a little more bitter. Like, I, I like that there's a much more rounded kind of complexion here. And because we're sorcerers and blenders, I couldn't tell you that many details about the barrels, that, like the physical wood on the barrels. But my gut tells me that they were a longer cure. They were a higher quality wood than a lot of other old barrels are right now. And because of that, it just didn't have as much bitterness to extract. Okay. Um, I think that another piece that a lot of brands and a lot of people in the industry don't really talk about is all of the ingredients you start with have a chance of rearing their head at some point in the life of a barrel as it's getting older and then being used and bitterness comes from wood, but it also comes in different amounts from wood and it stays around for different lengths of time. I think that there's some really, really good young bourbon, young whiskey, young rye, 
in Scotland, a lot of young scotch being made because mm -hmm. the attention about like, we need to pick barrels and treat them in a way that it's going to be good in two or three or four years uh, is a very different wood management decision. Oh, uh, definitely. And it doesn't, you don't really get to talk about cure time or uh, age of oak or grain density. Uh, people talk about char level, but like ultimately that's not affecting the entire barrel. Uh, and I, I, I wouldn't know for this, but I, I, I agree. I think that like the exact same whiskey in different barrels, even in the exact same places would have produced a much more bitter finish to it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and on this, I, I really like that it like, it has this very calm custardy end to the experience. Yeah, it, it, it's really big. It's sweet on the nose. It's oaky on the palate with like this nice like lemon curd custardy note. Like I get like a buttercream, cocoa, kind of like a roasted praline. And right about when I think it's going to dive into being bitter, it like really livens up on the finish, which I think is fun. You know, it this is certainly the most unique, I think, so far. Um, and I, I like it quite a bit more. Thank you for saying that. I would hope you'd tell me if you didn't. But I mean, I'm, I'm pretty once it gets I mean. You, you can all watch our Russell's Reserve 13. Like John was like, hell yeah. And I was like, too much oak. Like, get it away from me. You know, so um, yeah. totally. I'm sort of, uh, I'm in the same boat when it comes to the Tennessee stock. A lot of that stuff kind of pushed me away. Well, like like last year's uh, Barrelcraft mm -hmm. 15 yep. wasn't really up my alley. It just wasn't that Tennessee style was, it was driving too much for me. And this, I think, is just rounded out uh, a good amount more, really. I think comparing these two side by side would be very noticeable. Yeah, I, I'm excited to start doing some horizontals or verticals, depending on how you think about it with the 15 sure. year from different years. Oh, um, yeah. I uh, I wasn't able to hoard that much of the first one, but I've hoarded a couple bottles each of the second, third and now fourth Okay. Uh, to be able to do some events with that. I love it. Well, I mean, I, I think that this is it, it's really hard for me once bourbon crosses that hundred dollar mark, let alone and, you know, we did this with our bourbon single barrel. It, w it ended up being a five-year Kentucky. And we just told people it's going to be 110 bucks. It's five-year Kentucky, but it's going to be amazing. And that thing sold out and everyone, you know, everyone's like, you know, this is totally it. Five-year, we watched it blind. It killed everything. I'm kind of in the same boat with this. I'd love to see this go blind with some of the other big releases of the year and just kind of see where people end up. Because I think people, if you take away the label and just put the juice for it, I think people will be really interested and probably surprised at like how this fares. I hope so. Looking forward to it if you do it. I'll uh, I'll have to scheme that up. I got some tastings coming up this fall. Maybe we, uh, I'll get some folks in trouble. Yeah, uh, we'll provide the sample if you want to give us some good competition. Yeah, I mean, there there's big names out there, but uh, I think this is an excellent pivot. So uh, what should we uh, go on drink on next? So the next one I want to try is the the bourbon that I'm gonna get in a little trouble talking about, but all right, I'm good. I'm ready to like. get in trouble. <laughs> Nine ready nine. to be bad Perfect. uh so this doesn't have a label on the sample we sent you uh it just says gold label bourbon 113 proof that is correct uh so this is the first ever release of ours of a new line within the barrel craft spirits universe if we call the 15 year gray label this is what we call gold label okay uh spoiler alert the label's gold Oh, um, although it, it will come in a though. red box, we, uh, the gold boxes looked really cheesy. So we ended up with a, with a red box. Um, <laughs> did they, uh, did they look like that gold bar company, that gold bar? If they did, company? we would have used them. Okay. <laughs> I, I see that in Benny's every now and it, it literally looks I, like a big gold bar and I'm like, I see it in duty free all the time. And I'm like, I need to learn from the person who represents this brand, how they get all of the hardest placements. Okay. Like gold bar is in all of the places that I don't know who to call to even talk about whiskey to get it there. How is it in duty free in like <laughs> Las Vegas? I don't know. Like, uh, but anyway, so the gold label bourbon, uh, it's a 16 to 18 year old blend. Uh, the age statement is not on the front, but it is on the back. And I'll explain at the end why we decided to do that. It was a really okay. hard decision for us, but okay. uh, all of the components for gold label were ingredients at one point in one of the BCS gray label bourbon releases, either starting two years ago or last year or this year's release. Uh, and the reason for that is we took one of the components that we felt was particularly lean two years ago that we felt could handle more wood and we put it into toasted oak for two years. 
Uh, and we were really careful and patient about that because we were really, um, I, again, it's probably off brand, but giving someone else credit, we were really blown away by the original release of the Michter's toasted oak finish. And then we were all really disappointed by the second release. Uh, and Trip's read on it was like, they just didn't leave it in the toast for long enough. Um, that it wound up getting bitterness out of that second virgin barrel and it didn't soften out. Uh, and so we decided if we're going to do it, this is not going to be like a toasted oak finish. It's going to be a secondary maturation. It's going to be essentially long enough to be a, a straight bourbon, but it started at 15, 15 or 16 years old. Oh, um, this is opulent. <laughs> uh, so this is pretty woody and it's not all toasted oak finished. It's about 25% toasted oak finish, but the blend is constructed to be able to handle that additional marshmallowy toasty wood as part of it, but to incorporate it into it where it's still like a very complete bourbon and not just toast on a, I don't know, what would, what's the, I don't want to say lipstick on a pig. I don't want to make that kind of comment. I don't know, toast on a pumpkin. <laughs> no, I get it. Like, you know, toast, toasting is so meticulous and we've seen producers do it well and producers I don't think it do quite as well. And we've kind of battled with that. We've released our first toasted single barrels this year. And like, they require a lot more work. Like you have to be on top of it. And the moment it's ready, you have to pull it because toast just like has really interesting interaction. So I, I actually really like that the toast is part of the blend here, but it's not, you know, a hundred percent of the product, you know, cause that adds a whole additional facet to blending. Yeah. Essentially what happened with this is we, we made one irresponsibly expensive ingredient. We took something that could have helped us with an allocated item. And instead we, left it for two years, lost a lot more angel share, you know, didn't use it and paid for a whole new set of barrels for it, brought it back in and used it to blend something else. There's only, there's a little over 3000 bottles of this being released. So it's a very, very small release. No okay. uh, And the reason that we have the age statement on the back is because it's a 16 year old bourbon, the oldest being 18, but we have done some experiments with having only the toasted oak component be younger bourbon. Uh, because we found in comparing that set of barrels to some other experiments that we've been doing that even though the whiskey was better old bourbon going into toasted oak, when it was blended with other things, you, the toasted flavor note worked pretty well with five or six or eight year old bourbon going into it for a couple of years. Uh, and we know that our stocks though deeper than most are limited with high teens aged bourbon barrels. And so, we don't know what we're going to do next year, but I'm not trying to like convince people to hoard these, but this might be the only one that is a true 16 year old. The one next year may be a 16 year old base with a five or seven year old toasted oak blend into it. Okay. Uh, Interesting. But right. I might say that and then you hoard it and then it might be 16 again next year and then you're screwed. So, you know, well, I don't share, know. I don't leave some for the other people hoarding this. Have you, have you, we talked about it in the green room and my, my brain is fuzzy. Have we talked about what this is going to sell for? Cause I, I think that that might fix your hoarding problem. Uh, we're targeting a, a four ninety nine or a $500 price point for this. Okay. Um, only 3000 bottles. So, I mean, I, I don't know as hoarding will be a real big issue with that one, but I mean, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go I ahead. I, I, uh, I'm always really careful and hesitant to talk about price point with our more expensive things because I, I don't for any moment, want anyone to think that we don't know that that's a lot of money oh yeah um, i mean and, and that's where i was hoping you'd go with this like you know and and kind of like you you talked about with the first gray label you know 250 dollars, 300 dollars, wherever it falls in the market you know people were haters uh they didn't like it you know they had strong opposition and then it sold out and then they wish they could get some um this for me is the boss hog of barrel and i i right. think that that's absolutely i won't say a compliment like you guys can stand on your own accomplishments but i really like and john and i talk about this all the time I went and bought the 18 year whistle pig double bought rye because it was $400. And when I was ready to buy it, it was still there because like it was actually priced at where the market would have put it. Mm -hmm. And I think that this would do the same thing. You, you know, if you price this at $200, this would sell it immediately. People would flip it at 500. The people who wanted it couldn't get it. And, you know, and sure, $500 is a lot of money, but this is a kind of a luxury product anyways, right? Like no one technically needs expensive whiskey to survive. So right i you know the value's there clearly it's not inexpensive for you guys to make i i'm mm -hmm. i haven't given any notes but i actually really like this probably even over the gray 
Um, but yeah, price it where you want it to, you know, and heaven forbid it actually sits around for 90 days. And then the people who have time to go out after the first day of release and pick some up, you know, have an opportunity, which I think is great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and we're really seeing, hog is right. we've never, we've never been in this price point before. So we, as much as I like to pretend I'm someone who has a feel for the market, I really don't. Um, in terms of what this is going to do. And so it, it might be a day one, it might be a pre-sold out, it might be uh, sitting around for a long time. Uh, what we are trying to be very deliberate about is we are being clear with our distribution network and also with our key accounts, how much there is, how much is going places, what the expectations of spreading it out will be so that we don't wind up with a situation where if there's a whiskey bar in a city, they, they don't have the opportunity to buy a bottle. Um, because that is, we've learned the hard way with some of the things that have won awards that they don't necessarily go to the people who like deserve them. They don't necessarily go to good whiskey accounts. They go to the people who are, they go to the squeaky wheels. Yeah. Um, and like I applaud the squeaky wheels of the industry, but as a, as a supplier, as a producer of whiskey, you like really hope that you can get things to the places you want them without, you just like, you want to prepare everyone who might be on the same side as you for fairness. Oh yeah, for the situation, it, and that's, that that might be the toughest part of the whole supply chain is right. Once your product makes it to market, is figuring out, you know, you're gonna want ten, you're gonna want two. There's some validity to both sides, but and and it only takes one botch release to be like, oh crap, we didn't know that they were gonna take thirty percent of the allocation for this market just because they could, you know, right? Like, or that, like lessons you learn of like, oh okay, for this state we're not going to release the purchase order until we get an email confirming to us back that they read our email about allocation requests because it's like happened once <laughs> all went to one store. Yep. Person didn't open the email. Yep. So like now you don't get the product till you acknowledge to us that you read our advice. Uh, uh, dude, getting people to read emails is my life's biggest chore at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I shit you not getting, I do all sorts of weird trickery just to try and get people to like, not even just open the email, but also like read it to the bottom. Like you don't have to yep. read it comma for comma, but just like get to the bottom, like read it, have some comprehension. But uh, so it, it's actually kind of nice because sometimes I'm like, oh, this is just a uniquely like me problem at this other different weird level. But knowing nope. that a full blown supplier has the same problems, I think it's really interesting. A, a, and like a supplier that is trying to be like, here's money that is going to set immediate for you. Yeah. Just please read the email. Uh, every once in a while we work with someone and I'll get an email back that says something like, I'm in receipt of this email. It's a, I'm in the market. I will get back to you later this week. And it's like, I'm going to love this person. Like, the, the like <laughs> I see it. I'm on my phone. I'm not answering. I'm not reading it, but I got it. Ask me in a couple of days. It's like, oh, if I could have 50 of those. Yeah, we'll get there someday. Yeah. I love it. Cool. Well, uh, John, what do you think? What do you think of this, my friend? I dig this quite a bit, actually. Um, the nose on it immediately kind of woke me right back up and like i was surprised with how much i liked the gray label because last year i wasn't really a huge fan of how tennessee forward it was for me really liked that and then jumped into this and i was like wow this is uh this is like like i said earlier opulent it's just like just a very rich rich bourbon here this is really nice I think comparing this to Boss Hog is a really great idea too, Jay, because, I mean, like you mentioned, you don't go buy a bottle of Boss Hog and then hold on to it for three months and try to sell it to one of your idiot buddies for 200 bucks more than you bought it for. Like, Boss Hog is priced for a drinker to buy. You buy one of those, you open it, you drink it with your buddies, you have a good time. I could see this being in that same category where it's like that once a year special release of something that you really look forward to. This is... um. This is nice. What what I like about this one, and this is kind of unique too, is it's it's big and sweet up front, really big, creamy. I noticed that kind of marshmallow fluff sweetness mm -hmm. on the palate, which is fun because I I usually get like a little bit of fake marshmallow, a little bit of like toasty caramel, kind of burnt creme brulee on some of these over toasted or under toasted. But um, big like mar, it sounds weird because like fluff is like ninety nine cents a can or whatever people put on a peanut butter and fluff sandwich, but like really yeah like rich decadent opulent palette but then it's got a really spicy finish which kind of it surprised does. me and it keeps it from being too sweet which is, is kind of my beef with some toasted stuff is they're just so sweet from start right. to finish and and they almost have a 
aluminum kind of aspartame note on the finish. And I don't get that here, which I can really respect. Yeah, the uh, the Old Porsche 1910 for me is just like too much of this like chocolatey, syrupy, marshmallow. And it was like a really cool idea. And I actually like using it as an ingredient in things. I just don't like to sip that on its own because it's just driven way too much by the uh, extreme char that they use and you know their whole double barrel process. So a lot of toasted things actually have kind of pushed me away because of that same thing. That toast is driving. It's doing all of the work and it's not allowing any sort of balance to come through. Mm -hmm. and I think that, that spice is definitely essential here. Yeah, when we were putting this together, the toasted oak is on one of the ingredients that we, especially for the BCS line and also the what we call the evergreen line, so dovetail or made of seagrass, what we focus on most is setting ourselves up for success by making ingredients, not by making the whiskey from the very beginning. We try to get the ingredients where we want them to be. And then there's the like, how can we make the marriage of these two or three or five or seven things as good as possible? And so uh, we want everyone to get the notes that they like from toasted oak, but it's not really a toasted oak finished whiskey. It's a, it's a bourbon blend that one of the ingredients is a toasted oak finish. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if there's anything else in the market that's doing that right now. I think every other toasted oak finish is like the whole thing went into toast and then. Yeah. I think and, that's probably why I dig it so much because a lot of the other things it is just like you said, the entire thing is a toasted finish and then it just, it becomes too far into one lane and it doesn't really showcase itself very well. And this has a lot more of that balance that I wish some of the other products would bring to it. And honestly, I mean, I know we're still waiting for Wild Turkey 1 to come out. That's also toasted. You know, toasting is extremely hot right now. People are toasting everything. Um, and, and honestly, I'll admit, it hadn't occurred to me either to make toasted just part of a larger component. You know, I think people are concerned, you know, Wild Turkey is throwing really old barrels. They're going to throw them all under toast. Kind of a kind of a risk there. I'm sure it's going to pay off if, if the Russells are putting their name on it. But I think that toasting something and making it part of the final blend is, is a really great way to manage the risks, you know, and kind of the, uh, I'm trying to think the polarity of something like a toasted barrel. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's actually a, an interesting intro into one of the private release whiskeys I want to try if we, if you're ready to move on. Yeah, let's do it. Because, uh, I'd like to go to AJV one first, if that's okay. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, which is a Barolo finish. It's, uh, mm. A uh, producer called GD Vira, really, really famous, family-owned Corolla producer, uh, specifically one of their crews called uh, Rivera. Um, but I'm so lucky that I've worked for Jeff for almost seven years now. Okay. And part of my employment agreement with Joe is I get to take five days a year to travel to a alcohol producing place to like not learn specifically whiskey stuff, but just like just get immersed, learn. Yeah. Be immersed in, yeah. in an industry that is tangent to us. And oh, it's it, cool. It, uh, yeah, it's really, it's like, cause I was young when I started working for Joe. And one of the things that I, that brought me out of working for restaurants was that I, I wanted to continue to learn stuff. And Joe was like, I want someone working for the company that wants to go backpack through Jerez or whatever. Um, not that it inspired the gold label specifically, but in Piemonte where Barolo is and in a couple other really traditional wine producing regions where they don't want new oak, they want neutral oak on most of their wines. Mm -hmm. the, it's hard for them to figure out how to do the first use of barrels. Because oh, in America, okay. it's so easy. We want bourbon. It's like, obviously, the first use is bourbon. And then it's like, we sell it or you use it for something else. Yeah. But if, if you, everything you make is not oaked, what do you do with virgin oak? And uh, both the GD Vira and then at, at a place very close to them, uh, a producer called Finocchio, uh, they were telling me that they when they use barrels for the first time, they use a different grape. They use Barbera, or Dolcetto, or something else that... that and they don't just release that wine. It becomes a piece of their declassified Longhe Rosso table wine. Sure. 
And so it allows them to use slightly underripe grapes in a blend that they like but are too lean, and then they fatten it out with a totally sty like unstylistically correct wine that that was only made to get rid of the new oak so it could start being used for Barolo stuff. And it had nothing to do with the development of Gold Label, but thinking about <laughs> that now is like having the toasted as an ingredient and or like having a really fat red wine as an ingredient in a blend that doesn't need to be fat. Uh, it's like thinking about some of the best blenders in the world are, are in the wine industry actually because of Bordeaux blends and Meritage blends and declassified, like having to make hundreds of thousands of cases of declassified things and getting it to taste okay. Like all of that grind of, of wine production. Um, it's just like got me thinking about that. Sin talking to you about the blend and then thinking about my time with GD Vira when we were like talking about wine mostly, but then as soon as I brought up with them the idea of the whiskey, they were like, absolutely. And we had this amazing Zoom where Giuseppe, the from the family, Giuseppe Vira, uh, wanted to talk to Nick on our blending team who did the blends for these barrels yeah. uh, about like the spirit of each vineyard because he knew that the wine wasn't really going to carry through. But so Nick blended the whiskey to match how he felt about each of the three vineyards that we did. Oh, cool. Um, and so Rivera is a, a, a like pretty powerful earthy, like irony vineyard. Uh, and so Nick put a, a more bourbon focused blend into it. It's like a, a slightly woodier, slightly more powerful, uh, pretty high proof. I can't remember exactly what this one is, but yeah, I think it was like 132, 133. Yeah. Um, and I just, we, we just started pulling samples and release. We bottled these like a week ago. Oh, um, cool. And that, that, this is one of my favorite parts. I know, I know we get to drink crazy whiskey, you know, before it's released. I know we get to talk about the newest, hottest stuff. But like the last time you were on, I remember we were talking about Riesling and Ice Wine and, and Herman J. Weir uh, up in the Finger Lakes, like, and now we're talking about Barolo stuff that I would not have expected. Um, this is fun stuff. I yeah, I think some of the wine finish stuff has been the things that it's I been never killer. <laughs> I never would have guessed that I would even go for. And those recent finish were like they were nuts. I remember how much that I really, really was impressed by those. And this one, man, this is uh, totally wild. There's a lot. I was not prepared for this when I first started nosing this. I had to go back like three times at first. Be like this is that really what. Oh that? man, this is fun. That's fun. That's a good way to put it. This is much. What is the proof on this guy? I think it's, it's one thirty-two, but I can double check. Okay. Yeah, one thirty-three. Yep. After the one thirteen, yep. this was a noticeable hike, um, which I like. Um, whew. That's got character. There's there's no other way to put that. So we did nine barrels of Barolo finish, three each of three different crews. Okay. This one just says RAV on the label because we wanted to respect the uh, commonly owned intellectual property of the vineyards in Barolo. So it, we used the abbreviation. So we, we didn't want to use the actual words. Sure. Um, and this particular one, AJV1, will be available on our website at some point in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the other two Rivera finishes will be available as picks for people for accounts that have particular particular wine focused groups. Um, and the same thing goes for Brico de Viole and Costa de Rosa, which are the other two crews we did from them. Very cool. Okay. Wow. I'm this actually impressed. A, I mean, a little bit nuts. Yeah, go ahead. You got that John? Well, I mean, I was trying to dissect this a little bit because there's a bunch of spice in there that I wasn't expecting to get. And so this is like, it kind of rolled around like an Initially, I was like, man, is it like an almost root beer note? And then I was like, <laughs> wow, you know, it's not. Is it like a sarsaparilla thing? Is it like a hawhound? Like, what is it that, it that spice is coming through? And it's like, it after a sip, it's almost kind of like a little bit of a Dr. Pepper sort of. Mm. There's just like so many things going on at the same time between this buttery, fruity wine finish that I'm kind of really digging anyway. And then it's got this big old pile of some type I, I can't really nail down the spice yet man like yeah, i keep going back and forth of what i think it it sort of comes through as but it just keeps shifting on me there's so much going on with it yeah it's interesting i i kind of made this assumption that these were going to come out and be really tough because barolo is such a tannic wine it really is 
but in talking to Nick when she was putting it together and tasting them, it was like that tannin has just can't it it high proof whiskey just beats it. Uh and and really it was like the structure of French oak and the structure of that wine being a like acidic, not in a way that you taste, but in a way that it helps pop flavor. Um if you ever had the experience with cooking where like you put a little bit of lime juice or a little bit of vinegar or something in food and it doesn't taste acidic, but it makes other flavors come out really well. Sure. Uh, I think that that is the best use of good wine finish that yeah. it, because wine is not distilled, there's like active acid in it still. Oh, this is cool, nice. man. There's like this really nice butterscotch background to it. It's kind of, I think, floating this mild sweetness to mix in with all the other stuff going on here. I think that uh, oak spice in there, whatever it is, man, is really exciting. Yeah, that... I mean, it's extremely rich, which is kind of fun. Like usually big whiny things are, are more about the focus of the wine instead of what they can contribute. And I feel like this is very equally sharing the weight of contribution from the whiskey itself to the wine. Um, and I, I like, you know, I'm always concerned about tannin. I hate things that are overly tannic. That's like extremely well documented and just beaten completely to death at this point. But um, I, I like pairing tannic wines with whiskey because it, it actually kind of helps kind of absolve that. Um, and the, the root beer note is interesting because I, I was kind of grappling with this gingerbread kind of orange peel, um, like black currant cranberry note. That's like ever so slight, but it really works well with that nice big oaky backbone. Um, and the fact that this is, I mean, I would say, I mean, 130 plus is, is nothing to sneeze at, but I would probably take this over Booker's with, with little reservation. It's quite a thing to say to someone like me and the bookers is like a gold standard in my book so ah i don't know it, it it's fun and interesting and usually when people are like all right red wine finish and you hold it up and you're like yep that's really red the the wine is driving here it's nice right. to see a really nice shared responsibility between the wine and the base spirit yeah this is incorporated nicely there's just the uh... So much. I feel like every time, like I give it a few more swirls, try to get it to evaporate a little bit more and see what it does. And it shifts like just in the glass here, just over the whatever seven or so minutes we've been speaking about it. It's really this is a fun pour. It was also really cool to me just to see the the meeting we had with Giuseppe and with Nick, where Vira is a like generational family owned company. And to have Giuseppe be like, I just want to show you pictures of these vineyards so you understand why they're important to me. And to have Nick, who Nebbiolo is her favorite grape. So like this oh, was, really? uh, and to have her be like, I will stay on this meeting as long as you want. Tell me everything. Uh, it was just like, it was, I, I got to be there, but like, I just like was kind of hanging out with them. And it was so cool to see her be like, I want to blend these whiskeys with the passion that this person has about the wines. Um, that's awesome. And I have a feeling they're going to get a little lost in our portfolio, like the marine layer ones did, where like people really like them, but it's just there's a lot of things to talk about. And you can only tell people specifically about like which crew of Barolo it was yeah. so many times in a week. Um, but I, I'm, I hadn't had this specific one before. I'd had some of the other ones. And this is, I'm glad to have be trying this for the first time with you guys. I'm really, really, really excited about it. Yeah, I mean, I would really love to. I know we're not a wine focus house. Like, I drink a lot of wine, and we're not a wine focus house, but like, one of these would be super cool for the Reddit community. That's really, this is really interesting finish. I love it. It's not, you know, it's not spirit forward. It's not wine forward. It's not sherry forward, PX, Armagnac. You know, there's a place for all those things where, yeah, the base spirit is present. Let's just give it all the finish it's got, and we'll see how those two things marry into some dessert wine kind of kind of hoopla. But this is extremely well integrated, and like Barolo is no joke. Like that is difficult to work with. Yeah, if you this is I don't mean this in a salesy way, but if you want to do another blind tasting where I bring only weird finishes, but you don't know what they are, Done. that sounds like a really fun tasting to do. And I know that we owe a couple people inclusion in that tasting, so. Yeah, I was going to say one of our, our green room after this conversation things is to talk about we've got some barrels coming up, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll pin a bubble in that one because I'd love to come back to that. Cool. You guys ready to move on? I know. Yeah, why don't, we do, uh, why don't we do one more? We'll kind of do it a way and then we'll, we'll wrap on up. How does that sound to you, John? Yeah, I've got the 
cognac pack here. I, I don't know if that's what you were going for. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if you guys wanted to taste seagrass again or not. But Oh, um, to be completely honest, John and I have drank so much seagrass, and we okay, will continue cool. to drink more of it. Okay, uh, we, We've great. beaten that drum very thoroughly. Let's do <laughs> let's for, do the cognac park finish then. Reasons, yeah, <laughs> hell yeah. I mean, I would love to sit and talk seagrass with you, but uh, we, uh, John and no, I... No, no, I, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't, you know, breaking up your plan. No, no. No, I think John and I probably talk about seagrass at least twice a week. I do. <laughs> it's like a, a running joke in some of our chat communities, actually, how my, uh, my standard operating procedure is just to put a straw in a bottle of seagrass. <laughs> yeah, people have been sending him, like, curly straw links. <laughs> I love it. This one's for adults. Uh, so this is from the same line, the AJ line. Okay. This is AJP4. There are also four Cognac Park, or sorry, nine Cognac Park finishes, AJP1 through AJP9. Instead of being uh, three different vineyards, it's three Cognac Park VSOP finishes, three Cognac Park XO finishes, and three Cognac Park Bordery finishes. Uh, so nine different barrels that we did. Uh, and this is an XO finish. Is this the same base whiskey as the one we just tasted? It is not the same exact base whiskey, but it is a whiskey blended from the same base ingredients. So okay. the the ratios of what went into it are different, uh, but the okay. the tools available to Nick in putting it together were the same. I haven't tasted Ooh. it yet, but on the nose, there was something in there that was, it struck me as being so similar that I thought that there was a really good chance that they were the same exact. Yeah, thing. I, I know where you're going with this. This is um, spice drops and pound cake, and I love it. Yeah, it's it a little sw pound cake, yeah. sweeter from the XO finish, but it's a, the whisk, whiskey is definitely leaner that went into it. Okay, okay. And this is the... Uh... Oh, and this is also no joke. 132 proof. Okay. The uh, the proof on the nose, this is, is much less proofy on the nose, which is kind of... Uh, I won't say deceptive, but I would say probably dangerous. Oh, that grape really holds on there. It's big and sweet and fruity for quite a while. Mm hmm. That's a long finish. Wow. Uh, I hate to say voluptuous, but like that is mm. an extremely full, like really round profile. What was cool to us is, you know, Cognac Park does Mizunara finish. Mm hmm. And so when we approached them about doing Cognac Park finishes, they were like, a, absolutely, that's so cool. Oh, because really? they're doing all of these experiments in their facility in France. And so to be, to turn the tables on them a little bit, they were excited. We also just by chance share distribution with them in a lot of places. And so it made sense because it it's going through the same distributor. Uh, and Backbar Project, who represents them in America, yeah. there's a lot of synergy friend wise between Barrel and Backbar Project, which is like a lot of people know each other that work for one of the two. Interesting. Um, I did not know that there was that overlap. I'm a huge Ihagorio fan. Um, yes. So uh, El Ihagorio on the Agave side, even though it's the same people, uh, we don't work with sourcing in any way Yeah, yeah. in Agave. I, but uh, just like some funny little things, Kai, who's like one of the founders of Back Bar, was really kind to me early in my career. And then a woman named Annie, who now works for Back Bar, hired me to work for Rum Clement. She was my first boss on the brand side. That's right. Uh, I forget about your time in agriculture. Um, and so uh, it, even though we worked directly with Cognac Park on this, not with Back Bar, the connection came through a friend. And so they, there was, it was like trusted. Uh, and it was really cool for us to be able to put like a real Cognac house on, on the bottle. That's awesome. Yeah, because yeah, cool. most That's places a hell of a finish. don't, uh, you know, most we places kind of bridle you. We have some finishes that just say cognac or exo cognac, but but the cognac yeah. park ones say cognac park. That's nice, and it's I like it because you do you do get that cognac character like right as the cognac's trying to take over, the whiskey brings it back. Uh, not as spicy a finish, but no, it's a sweeter finish for sure. But it it's holds a, on yeah. a long it's a time. fruitier, sweeter whiskey. Yeah, it's not quite as brooding a whiskey. Yeah, I mean the uh, going back to the, uh, I don't think I'm gonna be able to pronounce it, or at least in a way that's gonna sound good to anybody. But the the one that we tried right before this, it's just Vira. Was, the J is confusing, but it's imagine it was V A I R A. Okay, I'll, I'll work on that privately and I'll get back to you. Yeah, 
Um, I, I feel like that one was crazy on the nose. Tons of layers of spice. And was a little drying on the palate, but not in a bad way. It was just, a, it just you know, sipped a little bit drier here. And this is, like Jay said, voluptuous. Just like this sweet. You know, it just holds on a long time. It, it's really nice. I, I don't know between the two of them which one I like more because they're so different. But they're both really, I mean, they elevate a lot of different flavors. And they do it in very unique ways. This reminds me of those really nice Riesling finishes. This is a little more grapey, obviously. Yeah. But... <laughs> oh, yeah. That's nice. I think uh, I think I'm still leaning Byra though. I I was just amazed by the complexity there. Who baby? And this is both okay. Indiana, Kentucky. That that's a nice blend too. Like it, it's it's working nicely with the wine, with the character of the wine. Yeah, I actually think that the Indiana, Kentucky blend takes to finishes a little bit better than the Kentucky blend did. I I would agree with yeah. that. The um, these have both been really on the money. I think they're for two different kinds of drinkers, maybe. I think that I I lean towards more the Vira, but like if I wanted a nice desserty whiskey that wasn't sweet, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. this this would absolutely be on the menu. Not yeah. that not that it's easy, but I find the Cognac Park to be safer in some ways. Yeah. Oh sure. I could see um, it without the layers of spice and stuff to it for sure. Oh man. That's nice. That's fun. I'm glad you like me. And Those Cognac, it's always good to see. I love seeing Cognac start to um, percolate among the whiskey community, whether it's in finishes or people, you know, whiskey people just getting excited about Cognac. Mm -hmm. because, and Armagnac. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, clearly. Um, you know, pretty much any kind of brandy, especially like Calvados and some of those more, I won't say avant-garde, but, you know, you, it's, it's hard to hand like a whiskey drinker Cognac or Calvados and just be like, ah, try this and I hope you like it. Armagnac is, is more of a kind of segue but it, it's fun to start to see these big crossovers where people can really get excited about cognac park and then go just buy cognac park and then right. see you know that i love that i love the bridge between spirits and, and we even have a mezcal finished bourbon coming out soon where i hope just gets enough people on the bridge they can decide to get back off if they don't like it but right getting people on the bridge to trying these other things is like a huge passion and it's fun because usually it works like you just have to be careful and like methodical and like have a plan and if you have excellent blenders like clearly you guys do like nick is is you know i wouldn't say they go to blending but like is up there like her talent is 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 clearly demonstrable and like it usually works yeah i've been really impressed with i think really will actually in like the amount of tastings that we've done now and the amount of bat shit things that you sent us so we're always just like <laughs> we're like send us something weird like we want to try crazy shit and i think i've got to the point where i'm just like I don't know is you're going to send me anything that I'm going to tell you is actually weird. I mean, you're going to send us all sorts of crazy shit. And every time I'd be like, man, you know, I really like that. These See, are all as much like, as that's an amazing that. compliment. Like now I'm like trying to think of like, what, what do we have? It's so weird that John must just think it's weird. Armida um, too. Armida too. Yeah. yeah you, would, you would have to outdo my very first sip of Armida. I think for me to actually be like, mm, I don't know. That is weird because now it's just like everything that we've been trying, like, one of the single barrels that uh, you sent us uh, in our last selection was a extremely crazy rye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was super piney. It was like, I think also a really low barrel yield. Yeah. And that was really fun. I liked that one. I would have been really happy if we picked that one, but it, I mean, it oh, wasn't really up yeah. Jay's alley. It was, uh, it was woody and spicy and a little bit just like kind of a crazy rye, which I thought was cool. I, well, I do remember Will being like, oh, I'm thankful you didn't pick that one because it yielded like, yeah, it's like I think it was like, it was like 37 bottles. bottles of, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Even lower than that. Yeah. But, you know, that's fun. Like, you know, it's hard to get really crazy weird, but like this is fun weird and I, I encourage yeah. it all day. Fun weird. But I'm also into crazy weird. So keep it in mind. Yeah. I, we got it in mind. We've, uh, we've got some projects we're working on. Yep. Just don't send me anything peated or else you're going to hear me tell you that it's not good. Fair enough. <laughs> Someday I'll, I'll break John of this. Someday. Challenge accepted. Generally Someday. how it goes. Uh, when we have people start on the sales team, uh, one of the willisms that has started happening is we do a whole tasting and we ask people what their least favorite is and then they have to drink a little bit of that every day till they like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and right, it's just right a way of like, it. like, it might not be your favorite at first, but you're going to taste this till you appreciate it. Yeah, you'll get to where you can appreciate it for sure. That is the most compassionate hazing I've ever heard of in my life. 
like my entire <laughs> life. Is it like Campari or peat it or, or is it all barrel product? No, it's all barrel. It's just like, okay, if you're not a rye drinker, like you're, you got to love barrel rye. Oh, okay. Uh, you okay. know, the, the um, Wisconsinite me pictured you being like, and here's two ounces of Fernet, like, and here's two ounces. Of I mean, Lord, I would like, love to do that, but uh, hazing's illegal for a reason. That's good. That that was your union labor test of the week, and you passed. Yeah. <laughs> well done. We we've been planning to really pin that on you, so uh, yeah, you know, it's part of You've our compliance well. efforts here at Weekly Whiskey. But um, <laughs> that's good to know. All right, so get a job at at Barrel, um, and then drink. And then tell me your drink. favorite is your least favorite. That's yep. kind of the and then trick play me. The game. Yeah, I'd be like, hmm, it tastes like Gold Label. Yeah, geez, you know that Gold Label. Don't like it. I, I wasn't crazy about it, Will. So you're gonna have to start <laughs> sending it over. Not one bit. Uh, but cool. Well, um, this has been fantastic. Super cool. I would say that this has been top shelf across the board, but that gold label is no joke. That yep. is. That's a heavyweight. Um, really it, appreciate your vote of confidence. It's it. This is like a weird first world problem to have, but like usually when I want something like Boss Hog, it's always there. And now with Boss Hog and Barrel Gold Label, I know that it's going to go super quick, but them sitting on the shelf, like it's actually going to be a hard decision, right? Like, Boss Hog has always been like, oh, yep, all right, it's time to buy the next Boss Hog. I've been prepping for this for six months. Let's go and get it. Um, now I'm going to have to pick, which is tough, but I'm into it. Well, you know a guy. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we got we to gotta call that <laughs> Lucky guy. Lucky us. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, you got any uh, final thoughts, John, and then we'll wrap up this rodeo? No, I want to thank Will again, though, for sending us all this stuff. Again, like the amount of ingredients like the plethora of things that you guys put together it just continually amazes me really i mean every time i think i think jay and i will talk about this you know ahead of time before our show be like do you know what will sending us like you know what never mind let's we'll just find out when it gets here like it'll be a cool surprise and then stuff shows up and i'm like i don't even know how to pronounce some of this like oh well i'm sure it'll be cool like i'm at the point now where i have full faith in everything that you guys are putting out because it's like I, you haven't really steered us wrong yet and we've tried things that like i said i've never even heard of i think it's really getting to the point where you guys are just putting on a master class of blending i mean like you said your evergreen portfolio there the armida seagrass dovetail those products i think really can speak to the new barrel consumer to be like this is what these guys can do like they could take all of these different products and turn them into this end result that you're going to really like and to me, I think that really showcases what Barrel's doing. And I just hope you keep doing it and keep pushing the boundaries. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. And also, so you and whoever watched this knows, talking to you about what is usually like the most complicated whiskeys that we're releasing in that season or whatever it is, uh, and having you guys taste so many things and having you comment on them and compare them to things and know that there are other people that watch this and are thinking about it and comparing it to things. It is, you don't get to interact with the consumers and the whiskey lovers who really are driving the industry that allows companies like Barrelcraft Spirits to exist that often. We usually have to work through a distributor and through stores and through bars and all of that. And so it, it keeps us doing it to be able to come on shows like this and have people like them and then and like really see it and see the comments about the YouTube video, like have things that we talk about on this show get requested in random places in the country after <laughs> uh, I, I've been on here enough to like, I, I come cause I love it, but like we see it afterwards uh, and it, it means a lot to me to be included and to like get a positive, but also honest opinion from you. I love it. it it's always a pleasure to have you, whether the holiday is major, minor, religious obscure or otherwise it's it's always good to have you here and obviously the whiskey is great too but um uh, if if people are looking to find more from barrel where can they find it will uh so barrel at barrel bourbon is pretty much all of our handles twitter instagram facebook is easy to find barrel bourbon.com also stellum spirits.com same thing with facebook stellum spirits on instagram uh the two companies are different in that we have sort of different perspectives while we're doing the work and we source barrels a little bit differently and we treat them a little bit differently. Our distribution networks are a little bit different, but it's still the same people behind them. Okay. Uh, and as we've talked about before, Stellum is by no means a discount whiskey, but it is a little bit of a more digestible price if you're not sure about us. And, and we stand behind it as much as any other thing we make. And so 
uh, those are sort of the two ways you're getting the same people, but it's two different routes to ask us the questions, if that makes sense. I love it. I think that's the that's best really way to explain it. it. Um, and honestly, we get emails all the time that like they're the same, but different, but the same. And then I think about that movie uh, with uh, James Franco and I'm like, yeah, it's the same, but different, but the same. And so we could yeah. use <laughs> same, same. Uh, that. That's a great the, uh, descriptor. But Will, thank you again for your time. It's been fantastic to have you. Um, I can't wait to go buy some gold label when the gold and the, the red box ship out and out. But um, thank you guys, everyone. This has been kind of a marathon episode. We love to roll these out with Will. It's always a good time. Cool, the whiskey's fun as well. If you're looking for more from John, you can find him at The Bourbon Finder. He's on Instagram and he has a website. He's covering everything all day. And I know that you can see these reviews here shortly as well. I am Jay from Whiskey Raiders. We are the Rotten Tomatoes of Whiskey. Um, and together we are the whiskey. Um, we're weekly whiskey. We're here on Tuesday nights live we're here on thursdays for after hours and if you like what you're doing you can support us at patreon.com slash the whiskey net um personally i'm gonna go scamper on off drink some more of this um oh shoot i already forgot the name um the cognac park i think this one's fun <laughs> but uh we'll catch up in the green room thanks so much for your time guys and uh thanks for joining us cheers everyone thanks so much for having me yeah cheers guys